Good afternoon and welcome to the School of Mathematical Sciences at the University of Southampton. I'm the head of the school, Professor Marika Taylor. and I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about the geometric universe. So this talk is really um, telling you about university level mathematics and really contrasting it with what you learn at school. So what is modern mathematics? A lot of what you learn at school is mathematics, which was discovered back in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. And when you study mathematics at A-level, um, you study things like pure mathematics. So you learn calculus, you learn how to differentiate, you learn how to integrate, you, you learn things related to algebra. Many of the things that you learn there were discovered, they're very important, they were discovered in the 16th, 17th century. And then the applications of these things were, you know, derived really in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. So in school mathematics, there's a lot of focus on applications of mathematics to things like mechanics, um, which were incredibly important in that period. You also these days study things like statistics, and in some cases you might study decision mathematics. Now, university level mathematics is very, very broad. Um, we've got a long tradition in the United Kingdom, actually, a very broad study of mathematics. And what we call pure mathematics and applied mathematics and statistics at university level is actually quite a lot more diverse than what you see at school level. And one of the aims of this talk is really to, to, to help you to sort of start to explore what you can what you can study at university in mathematics and what you might be interested in in learning more about. So pure mathematics at university level, well, calculus and algebra, you, you would do some of that. You would take it further than the calculus that you've done at school, but you would also do things related to group theory, number theory, geometry, topology. And these are things that I'm going to explain, particularly the geometry and topology as we go through this talk. Um, if you think that you hate applied mathematics, don't worry, because at university level, applied mathematics isn't just about you know, 19th century mechanics. It's really a very wide range of, of applications of mathematics to sciences, you know, physical sciences, physics, computer science, uh, chemistry, uh, engineering, medicine, as well as for using mathematics for addressing socioeconomic questions. So things like, you know, modeling, um, how, um, what you need to invest in order to get a good return in your pension, um, trying to understand how information spreads on a social network like Twitter. All of these things are things which, for which you need to apply mathematics techniques. University level study of mathematics um, also includes statistics. And again, statistics is, is much broader than what you study in school. Um, it goes you know, really into um, questions of, of probability theory, questions of you know, how do you design experiments to get the most information out of them? How do you kind of take very large amounts of data and infer um, information out of that data? University mathematics um, looks at applications of maths to economic questions, as I said. Um, so in particular, um, the financial world relies on mathematics. So if you're trying to sort of predict and track, you know, the behavior of stocks, uh, that's where financial mathematics models come, come in. Actuarial science concerns itself with um, really questions of, of quantifying, um, explaining in a mathematical way, um, notions of risk. So this comes into insurance. Um, so both insuring your car, your house, life insurance, predicting how long people might live, um, predicting how much you need to invest to get a pension. All of these things are related to actuarial science. And again, they have you know, very deep mathematical foundations to them. Another branch of university mathematics that you don't really meet so much in school is something that's called operational research. So operational research, the thing it's most closely related to in school mathematics is decision mathematics. And decision mathematics, I think, captures quite a lot of what we mean by operational research. It's really using mathematical models, mathematical techniques, in order to make decisions about how you operate things, how you manage things. So operational research would be relevant, for example, to an airport where they're deciding how they're going to schedule their flights. You know, what is the most efficient way to have the planes moving out from the um, terminals onto the runways? How can they get them sort of coming through um, as, as quickly and as safely as possible? That's really, as you start to think about that, you really realize it's quite a mathematical problem. 
And there's a whole branch of mathematics that actually deals with that. Now, this is a, a, a you know, a one webinar, and I can't span all of the realm of university level mathematics. So I've picked out just one theme to actually talk about, which is um, geometry, topology, and applications it would have. And these applications really span all of the things that I've written at the bottom. So maths for science and engineering, socioeconomic questions, and actually also operational questions. One of the, one of the sort of um, interesting and, and fun things about mathematics is the, the sense to which it really goes from abstract concepts to applications. Um, so abstract mathematics is sort of you know, illustrated on the right hand side. You know, this is kind of you know, mapping out um, a, a tessellation of a plane. You can see it's sort of tessellated with little triangles. It's covered with little triangles, and then you're sort of seeing the patterns in it. That's obviously very abstract. I'm not going to particularly explain this picture during during today's talk, but it's a very kind of you know beautiful abstract um, understanding. But at the same time, we increasingly understand that you know very abstract mathematics often goes hand in hand with important applications. So we're going to talk about modern geometry and then we're going to give examples of how geometry is used in applications. And hopefully you'll see that the really wide ranges of mathematics, of uses of mathematics. The idea is to give you a flavour of what you might study in a maths degree. And then when we start talking about applications, it will give you a flavour of the kind of jobs you could do once you have a mathematics degree. So let's start with um, geometry. So geometry is something that you all know about because you've been learning about it in school, really right from the time that you start in primary school. So geometry, if you look up a, a dictionary definition, it's concerned with properties which are related to distance, shape, size, relative position. And as I said, when you, when you start learning geometry in school, Really, the way you start learning it is in terms of the properties of shapes. So right back in 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 sort of nursery, in 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 reception, you start sort of talking about two dimensional shapes and you learn the names of two dimensional shapes and you learn the properties of two dimensional shapes. And then as you move forward with, you know, in, in your school career, you start exploring three dimensional objects. And as you move to a level, as we'll come to in a moment, you start doing you know much more sophisticated geometry. Um, which goes back really to the work of, of people like Euclid, the ancient Greek Euclid. And you, you understand the properties of, of, of two dimensional, three dimensional objects. And in fact, the classification of these objects, you know, thinking about these things goes right back to the ancient civilizations. So it was, you know, Plato, the famous Greek philosopher, who really classified the, the types of um, regular three uh, regular three dimensional shapes you could have. So these are regular and uniform in the sense that each of the sides is the same, um, the same size as each other. And you can see here what they call a hexahedron. Um, we would usually call it a cube. So that's clearly you know, a regular shape in which each side, each face of the cube is the same size. Now, one thing you don't meet in, in school mathematics is a more abstract property of a shape, which is called topology. Um, but actually, we use topology quite a lot in our everyday life. So if we look at a dictionary definition of topology, this is really concerned with properties of shapes that are not changed under stretching, twisting, crunching and bending the shape. So if you if you basically squeeze, stretch, um, crunch and bend, we can call that um, deforming, changing the shape, changing, changing the object. But if you deform it in such a way, you actually don't change its topology. So in the picture on the right hand side, you can see your cup of coffee with your donut. These two things are, uh, they could be deformed into each other in the sense that if I thought that that donut was made of some kind of modeling clay, I could actually, you know, twist and shape, twist and crunch that, 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 that modeling clay and change it so that it turned into um, a cup of coffee. So to see how that happens, let me take you into a sort of series of pictures. So imagine that all of these were made of your pink modeling clay. So you start with something that looked like um, a cup. And you can see that actually from the point of, of point of view of topology, a cup which is empty 
is not different from a cup that's, that, that's full. So you can actually imagine just pushing up from the bottom a little bit more of your modeling clay and you go along the top row and these things, these things, you know, you would you would have just gotten this by just um, you know squeezing and, and and pushing your modeling clay. You wouldn't have had to break it anyway, you wouldn't have had to snap it in any way. You can actually just you know push it um, into each other and, and actually change it. But you can also, if you if you look at the bottom row of pictures, you can take the very same cup and you can actually again just keep sort of squeezing and twisting and turn it into something that looks like a ring donut. And this is in the sense in which we would say that a cup is actually um, has got the same kind of topology as a donut. So if we look at those things, what, what can we see as the defining feature? Well, what we can see is that the cup has a handle, so it's got one hole in it. And of course, our donut also has one hole in it. And that's the sense in which they are equivalent to each other. So if I try to make my donut equivalent to an apple, I couldn't do so because an apple doesn't have a hole in it. If I took a cup that has two handles on it, it was a, you know, a cup for a little, a little child that has a handle on both sides, that would have two holes in it. And again, I couldn't actually make it equivalent to a donut without cutting or snapping one of those handles, without kind of you know, doing something which is beyond actually just moving the clay around. So topology is a really interesting and, and, and interesting way to characterize the, um, the behavior, the shape, the geometry of objects. If we're thinking about surfaces which are classified, if we're trying to, to classify things by topology, we can sort of think about um, trying to work out which things are equivalent to each other, which things have the same topology. So we've already said that the cup has the same topology as a donut. So if we look at these pictures, which, which, which would be the things which are topologically the same? And I've almost given you the clue already in that I told you on the previous slide that what we needed to do was count the number of holes or the number of handles. So if we look at the little green eight at the bottom there, we can see it's got two holes. And if we're looking for something else which has got two holes in, 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 this, in this group of pictures, well, the bananas, actually, if we imagine those made of modeling clay, we could actually just squish the bananas up and we would actually just get something which was just a ball. Um, if, if we were doing this, if we were doing a, a, um, a live class, I would be passing modeling clay around the room to, to you all so you could convince yourself of this. Um, but you know, for today, we're going to have to use our imagination and imagine that we're playing with modeling clay. So the bananas is just, you know, we could squish that into a ball. If we look at the, the purple, um, it looks a bit like Mickey Mouse, doesn't it? Um, the purple sort of um, set of three rings, that's got three holes. I can't make something with three holes equivalent to something which has got two holes unless I do some kind of cutting. Uh, you know, maybe if I cut through one of those holes, I could make it equivalent. So that's not equivalent to the green figure of eight. Now, the thing that's at the top right, the old looking vase, if you look at that, that's got two handles, right? So two handles, again, is equivalent to having two holes. So those two things are, are said to be topologically the same. The figure of eight is the same as that, um, that old fashioned kind of um, um. And my Mickey Mouse purple ears, well, that's the same as my pretzel, which is sitting on the top on the bottom left, because that's also got three holes. Right. So the three holes on the bottom left is the same as the three holes in, in the middle. And then, you know, we've got our, our bagel that's sitting there. Well, our bagel is, of course, the equivalent to the cup and the donut that we've got over here. Um, I think that's sort of readily apparent that the donut has the same shape as the bagel. So topology is a really um, a fun concept and it's got many applications to it. Now let's turn to geometry. Um, so you might think that you have learned everything that you need to know about geometry. Um, so really since ancient times, what we learn in school about geometry has been based on the books of Euclid. Um, you can find you know, beautiful copies of the works of Euclid. Really what it is, is the study of figures in two dimensions and figures in three dimensions. So things in the plane, that's two dimensional. Things which are solid, that's three dimensions. And the formal Euclidean geometry is done on the basis of axioms, that's stating assumptions. And then given those assumptions, what you can prove. Now, when we first study Euclidean geometry, as I said earlier, 
we start by classifying different kinds of shapes. But then as you progress through your, your, your um, school career, you really start thinking about um, angles and shapes. You start thinking about properties of circles. So the Euclidean geometry properties, which are shown in the bottom pictures here, are quite complicated things. You may not have actually seen them in your school career. Um, much, of the, much of the work of Euclidean geometry, we no longer teach in the detail that we used to teach at the beginning of the 20th century. We don't go through every single um, theorem of Euclid. But the basic idea is there that we're really studying the properties of things that sit in a plane, the properties of things that sit on solids, and we're assuming certain behavior, and then we're, sorry, we're assuming certain, certain um, foundational properties, and then we're proving things about them. And you, many of you may have come across sort of, you know, fun sort of brain teasers, which are based on Euclidean geometry. So you have a square that's embedded within a circle, and, you know, you've got to work out, you know, relative, what, what's the length of the square, given certain knowledge about the, the circle. All of this is really based on Euclidean geometry. Now, Euclidean geometry is, in a sense, not the end of geometry. Um, so Euclidean geometry doesn't capture uh, an important property of shapes. So an important intuitive property of shapes, which we've already, in a sense, touched on when we are thinking about things like um, doughnuts and bagels, is a sense that they are curved. And so to describe more complicated shapes, it's actually useful to understand the, the, the shape of their curvature, the behavior of their curvature. And again, this is something which we have quite a lot of intuition about. We know that if we take something that's flat, if we take a slab, a plane, that has zero curvature. We know that if we take something round, whether that's a ball or an orange or an apple, or indeed the, the surface of the earth, that's something that has positive curvature. Where you can have something that's positive, you can always have something that's negative. And so you can also, you know, think of surfaces which have negative curvature. And in the picture on the right hand side, to give a sort of sense of that, um, that's shown a slab which has got zero curvature, so something that's flat, something that's got positive curvature, and something that's got negative curvature. And, and the difference here is that, you know, uh, straight lines in zero curvature in what people sometimes call Euclidean geometry, really look what you think of as straight lines. So we, we look at the left hand picture there of zero coverage and say, OK, those two little orange lines, they're straight lines. Things which are straight lines in, sense, in the sense of being the shortest distance between two points in positive curvature and negative curvature are actually not, um, you know, the behavior is not what you would see as straight. So they actually follow particular paths on the surface which are determined by how curved the object actually is. So one of the things that we, we learn in, in university study of geometry is how to describe curvature. Now you might say, well, you, you haven't, you know, you don't know anything about this, but actually you have been exploring this if you've been studying A-level. So in A-level mathematics, you look at curves. So you would often think of a curve where um, the position in the Y direction is given as a function in the X direction. So you study a curve. And then you characterize the shape of that curve using calculus. So you look at the tangent to the curve, you look at integrals under the curve, you really characterize the whole shape of the curve using ideas and calculus. And one of the things that you study in university level mathematics is more complicated calculus, basically calculus in higher dimensions. So you can do calculus on two dimensional surfaces, you can do calculus on three dimensional objects. Actually, even though the world around us has just three dimensions, from a mathematics point of view, there's no reason to stop at three. You can think about having a world which has got higher dimensions, and you can think about calculus in higher dimensional objects. Kind of makes your brain ache, and it's pretty hard to actually imagine things in four dimensions, things in five dimensions, and six dimensions, and so on. But at least mathematically, you can describe this. And so the picture on the right hand side, you can see that that's um, the, the, the colored surface. That's a surface in two dimensions. Um, hopefully you'd agree from the classification I've got over here of the three possibilities, zero, positive and negative curvature. You can agree that that surface seems to have positive curvature. So how do we ca characterize that? Well, really, we do something similar to what you've done in, in um, A-level in terms of curves. You really specify the shape of the surface 
And then you think about tangents to the surface and how they behave, and that, that, that allows you to describe curvature. So this kind of study, it comes under the names of multivariable calculus, vector calculus, differential geometry. It's many, you know, many math mathematics, um, parts of mathematics courses will include the study of calculus, in a sense, more and more sophisticated and complicated situations. So does this sound very abstract to you? Perhaps it does, but it's important to realize that actually this kind of abstract mathematics has very wide ranging applications. So let me give you a few examples of those. So my first example, so topology, you know, you say, well, why do I care that a cup and a donut seem to have the same topology? Why, why, why is that interesting? So here's an example of where topology is really important. I think we all know that we live in an era of big data um, in which much of our personal information is collected, harvested even, and analyzed. We know that there are entire teams sitting there at Facebook and other places, you know, taking our personal information and analyzing it for patterns. And that kind of analysis relies on mathematical methods. Really, when you've got such huge amounts of data as are generated these days just on, say, social media platforms, you need mathematical methods to get the patterns out of complicated data. And one of the interesting ways to do so is really to think about the geometric properties of the data. It's not the only way, statistical methods are also, statistics is also important, but here this, this is a, a, a particularly important way of seeing really big patterns in data. And again, this is something that builds on what you, what you, what you know and what you've done in school. So let me give you an example of data. What, what could I mean here? Suppose we took everyone in a school, um, a primary school or a you know, secondary school, and we plotted out all the students, their height versus their weight, and we plot them on a chart. And there's a, there's a sort of a fictional chart which is shown on the right hand side. So we're representing each piece of data as a point. And here it's a point in, in a two dimensional space. Now, instinctively, your eyes want to go and look for patterns in those plots. Your eyes sort of almost are drawn to find patterns. And part of what you're doing is really looking at the underlying geometry of the, the data. This becomes much more manifest when we look at things in higher dimensions. So this is just a two dimensional plot. Suppose we looked at more complicated data. Um, more complicated data. So suppose here, as well as knowing the height and weight, we also plotted the age. That might that would give you a three dimensional plot. There would be a there would be um, a third direction as well. So you'd be, be specifying your data by weight, height and age. So there'd be a third dimension. So we would get a three dimensional set of plots, uh, points rather. So more complicated data will be displayed in pot plots in higher dimensions. Um, now, our brains can only really visualize them in three dimensions, so you would often show three dimensional sort of slices of this, but it might be even higher dimensional. For the purposes of this discussion, so we don't wear out our brains too much at this time of the day, let's, let's just think about three dimensions. So the picture on the right hand side is just a plot of data in three dimensions. You can see that each point of data is shown as a little dot, and then we're sort of showing also some connections between the data with lines. So in that data plot, you can see the emergence of structure. You can see that some of the points seem to be clustering in some areas than others. You know, the purple and blue bits seem to be clustering together. The green and yellow bits seems to be clustering together. And hopefully you can see from that kind of plot that this seems to somehow, you know, be reminiscent of what we were doing when we were talking about the topology of objects. Your eye is starting to see that there might be holes in this data. There seems to be a big hole, which is sort of, you know, at the bottom, just next to the blue data between the blue and the green. There seems to be a little hole there. And actually, you can formalize this. You know, you, you don't just have to rely on your eye picking out the structure. You can actually define and calculate the topology of the data. You can basically define a way to count how many holes the data has. Now, imagine here, you know, we're just plotting a relatively small number of points. Suppose we've got a huge amount of data like all the Facebook users in the world, and we're plotting it out, you can see that actually kind of um, classifying it 
by these kind of big properties like how many holes does the data have really can simplify what is an enormous data set and see kind of big properties in that data set. So let me give you a real life example, which was carried out by somebody working in Southampton Maths. He was working with the, um, the University Hospital in Southampton. So this data on the right hand side is real data and it's data about genetic data from asthmatic patients. So everyone, every dot here represents a patient and the color of the dot you know, represents how bad their asthma is and whether they smoke or not. And then the position in which it's plotted depends on um, certain genetic characteristics of the person. Now, in this, in this uh, plot of data, um, you can then analyze the topology. And what the topology tells you, what it can be interpreted as, is new genetic relationships between people who have asthma. And then obviously genetic links lead to better understanding of how the disease develops and ultimately what you want is that it, it turns into better treatments. So in just a few slides, we've gone from something which was very, very abstract, really understanding you know, the holes in an object to using that kind of concept to understand real kind of medical data and then inferring from medical data new relationships which you wouldn't easily get by other methods that help you understand the progression of a disease like asthma much better. And then ultimately that information feeds into people who work in medicine to help them understand how to make better treatments for the disease. So we went from abstract to really applications um, in a series of steps. My second example is the geometry of the universe. Um, uh, you know, um, a, a, a kind of a big concept. Um, so back at the beginning of the 20th century, Albert Einstein developed his famous theory of gravity. I'm sure everyone here has heard this phrase. Um, it's called general relativity. So the picture on the right hand side shows Albert Einstein next to a picture of the Earth. And I'll explain in a moment what the picture, what the picture is actually capturing. So the theory of general relativity, his theory of gravity, really links the force of gravity to how much the space is curved. Intrinsically, um, the maths which is involved in Einstein's theory is quite sophisticated, quite complicated maths. And typically, although we're describing the, the, the behavior of the physical universe, the physical world, the mathematics is, is sufficiently complicated that Einstein's theory is studied in mathematics departments. So what was the picture showing on the previous slide? So here's, here's a sort of blow up of this picture. In Einstein's theory, the idea is that the weight of the planets and stars curves the space around them. So if we think about the, the, the Earth, the fact that the Earth is heavy means that effectively the space around the Earth is curved. And it's, you know, if we, you know, this, this explains why if we're sort of moving towards the surface of the Earth, why we're drawn into it. Again, if we were doing this in a sort of, a, you know, a, a, a real in-person session, at this point I would be passing you around a sort of um, a rubber sheet with marbles on it. So you could kind of think about the behavior of marbles on a rubber sheet. So something that's heavy kind of curves the sheet. Now, the shape of space determines how um, planets move around stars. It determines how the universe changes with time. Um, a famous physicist in the middle of the 20th century, John Wheeler, who also coined the name of black holes for, for you know, um, objects, the objects that don't emit any kind of light. John Wheeler said that space-time tells matter how to move, matter tells space-time how to curve. So the behavior, the whole behavior of gravity is really linked to how space is curved. And so this, again, seemingly very abstract object of abstract description of why would we want to use, you know, why develop calculus to describe curved surfaces? Well, actually we have to, if we want to understand the force of gravity, if we want to understand the details of how our planet is moving around the sun, how the, um, the galaxy is evolving, how the universe changes with time. It's intimately linked with understanding how, um, how to describe curvature, how to describe a curved space. Back in 2015, um, the LIGO experiment um, made headlines all around the world 
when it detected gravitational waves for the first time. So gravitational waves were predicted soon after Albert Einstein wrote, wrote down his theory of gravity. And the gravitational waves that they detected really came from colliding black holes. So the picture shown on the right hand side comes from a computer simulation. The little black dots represent black holes and they're going to spiral around each other and then collide into each other. Gravitational waves are really ripples through space. So as a wave comes through, space itself is stretched and squeezed. And so yet again, this is a case that we need to understand mathematically how to describe something that is curved. So here's a sort of here's a way to think about gravitational waves. So suppose you, 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 you have created a ring of particles. So the particles here are shown with little red dots and you spread them out on, an, on a little, your particles out on a little red ring. As the gravitational wave passes through, the ring gets stretched and distorted. And what's being shown in the picture is really a sequence of images in time. So you can think of the first, the first sort of ring there as being the first snapshot in time, and then each subsequent thing being a later snapshot in time. And so what's happening is that the, the ring is again being stretched and distorted. And hopefully you can see in that object that we, we clearly to understand what's happening there, we clearly need to know how the surface is curved. So some bits seem to be negatively curved and some seem to be positively curved. You know, to actually describe how gravitational waves are behaving, we need to know um, how to describe the curvature of space. And that's about, again, you know, calculus, sophisticated calculus methods. Now, if you say, well, gravitational waves are all very nice, black holes are all very nice, but I don't care too much because it doesn't affect me every day. Actually, um, Einstein's theory of gravity does affect you every day. Everyone who uses a smartphone is really using Einstein's theory of gravity every single day. So global positioning systems really rely on satellites orbiting the Earth. For the global positioning system to be reliable, we need to know the orbits of these satellites to very high precision. And it's not enough to use the Newton's theory of gravity from back in the 17th century. We actually need Einstein's theory of gravity to actually take into account the curvature caused by gravity. And if we didn't do so, your GPS wouldn't work. You wouldn't be able to find your phone when you've lost it because the GPS wouldn't be able to, it, it, it wouldn't be positioning things accurately enough. So every, you know, every one of us who's got a smartphone is actually using Einstein's theory of relativity every single day. And these kinds of calculations, by the way, of, of positioning, you know, orbiting of satellites, optimal positioning, this, I mean, heavily uses different branches of mathematics. Um, those of you who've seen the Hidden Figures movie about the space race, um, the American space race, and, and, and you know, the um, uh, sending, sending um, the air, uh, rockets up into space, um, you'll know that actually, you know, the, the, the amount of mathematical calculations that are required to actually get these, um, get orbits, to get things in orbit um, in exactly the right shape. So what can you study? I've been talking about geometry and topology and calculus. What else can you study during a degree in mathematics? So let me just give you a little bit of a flavor of this over the next few minutes. So I've already touched on this. Um, from the origins of the universe. So you might not think that this belongs in a maths department, but actually the description of Einstein's theory of gravity is sufficiently complicated and sophisticated that it's often studied in maths departments. So things like cosmology, that's the evolution of the universe, things like gravitational waves, things like black holes, are things that you can study as you go into your final years of, of studying a maths degree. So you can go from the origins of the universe to predictions of the future. So what's being shown on this slide is something really quite com completely different. So this is um, using methods in statistics to understand um, life tables. So that is um, what chance people have of dying at a particular age group. And this is incredibly important in terms of planning. So the Office for National Statistics work closely with Southampton Maths on life tables. It's important for planning, for planning pensions, for planning retirement ages. And these particular pictures which are shown here come from data that we worked on for the Office for National Statistics, which was really trying to understand um, 
you know, whenever you whenever you measure these things, whenever you get data, you actually have to um, take into account that there are gaps in the data, there are things that are missing, there are things which are kind of just random fluctuations. And this is kind of, you know, this work was really about smoothing the data and understanding what were the real features, what were the important features of it. Similar kinds of analysis of data actually takes place in understanding COVID cases and predicting COVID cases. So you need to go from the data you have to predicting the future. So this again is the kind of thing after building up your statistics background, that you typically study, you know, survival models, actuarial analysis you'd study in the last degree, last years of a maths degree. We talk quite a bit about abstract maths in, in the form of topology. That's what's shown on the right hand side. And you can see, you know, on the right hand side, I've shown you different classes of objects which have the same topological properties. But there are many other fascinating branches of abstract mathematics ranging from graph theory. Graphs are shown on the left hand side through to group theory, through to number theory. I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, Fermat's famous last theorem and the proof by Andrew Wiles of, of Fermat's last theorem, which really relates to the, 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 the theory of numbers. It's a theorem about positive integers. Uh, so all of these things are things that you can study. And we, you know, we build up our knowledge of those gradually over, over the course of a mathematics degree. But you can go from abstract mathematics really to essential. So we've talked about applications of topology to understanding data, but actually abstract mathematics, number theory is completely foundational in cryptography and network security. So again, number theory is something that you're using every single day, even though you don't know it, every time you send an encrypted communication over the web. Similarly, the graphs which are shown on the left hand side here are absolutely essential in understanding the behavior of networks. So these might be social media networks, they might be power grids, they might actually be cognition, so understanding the network of neurons within a human brain. And the picture you see here is really joining together little dots um, it's joining them together as a network and the lines sort of show the connections between the little dots. You could think of these dots as being users on a social media platform like um, Twitter. You could think of these dots as being households which are connected to, you know, and connected together by which electricity supply they're using, so a power grid. You could also think of these dots as representing um, parts of a human brain. But all of these, understanding the, the, the behavior of these, the behavior of networks, really links to understanding you know, the, the foundational mathematics. So some other things that you might study in a maths degree, you can go from health, so statistical methods to understand um, experiments for drug development with GlaxoSmithKline, so that's the sort of picture on the left. Incre increasing the efficiency of drugs for Alzheimer's disease, so all of these really rely on statistical methods to actually design the best experiment, the most efficient experiments. You want to do the minimum number of people being tested on a drug because there's risk to them, but you want to get the most information out of it. And again, this is something that's come very much to the forefront over the last sort of 18 months in terms of the vaccine development program. So really trying to kind of get the most information you can out of the vaccine trials as quickly as you can while minimizing the risks to people. And the more I describe it that way, the more you start to understand that that is a mathematical statistical optimization problem. So from wealth, right the way to wealth. So here are some other things that we've worked on um, in Southampton Maths. The picture on the left hand side, what is that? Well, that's the packing of a ferry. Um, so suppose you're a ferry operator and you're sending your ferry between you know, Southampton and the nearby Isle of Wight. You actually want to get as many vehicles onto your ferry as quickly as you can with as minimum gaps as you can. Um, so how do you do that? How do you load things? What's the order in which you put things there? What's the, the best that you can do in terms of packing? So that's an optimization, what we call an optimization problem. You know, given the constraints that you have, given the size that you have of your ferry space, given the, the amount of entry you have, given the time you've got to, to load vehicles on and take them off, how do you pack it as efficiently as you can? And we actually work with companies such as Red Funnel, which does sends its ferries between the Southampton and the Isle of Wight to optimise their, um, their packing. 
right hand side um, shows you an image of actuarial science. I said before that actuarial science is often concerned with risk. And so this is sort of mathematical modeling of this is in the context of financial maths about um, you know, what levels of loss are acceptable if you invest money and you lose some of it, what would be acceptable? What is the what is the frequency in which would, this would happen? And again, as I start phrasing it that way, you start to see that this is a, quite a sophisticated mathematical problem that needs to be solved. So let me conclude. Um, mathematics is, is a very, very broad discipline. I hope that's come across in, in what I've said through this talk. So what you what you do in school level mathematics is really just setting the foundation to go out in all kinds of directions from abstract mathematics to a really wide range of applications. A couple of years ago, the UK government asked Lord Stern to carry out a review of the importance of mathematics to UK society. And what I've shown here is a quote from Lord Stern's report that he said that we live in the era of mathematics its influence permeates economic and social activity. Its influence and impact are profound. There can be fewer, more productive, creative and exciting investments than investing in mathematics. Well, I think he had in mind investing here in you know, national resources in terms of you know, investment in universities and schools, investments in, 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 in research in mathematics. But actually, one can also interpret this as, an, as a personal investment, an investment of time in studying mathematics. We often don't think of mathematics as creative, um, but actually the, the whole process of solving tricky problems, difficult problems, whether it's an abstract problem that you solve by a theorem, whether it's an applied problem, it actually is a very, very creative problem, a uh, creative um, area. And it's something where you can find all kinds of interesting routes um, to, to apply your mathematics to the things that you find the most interesting. So mathematics degrees cover a very, very broad range. Um, people can specialize if they like to in a specific area, be that abstract pure mathematics or specific kinds of applications of mathematics, or they can keep a kind of broad mixture. And then they can go into a very wide range of careers. So the little, um, the little sort of um, collection of words on the right hand side gives you a sense of the kinds of variety of things that people go into. So what do people do with a maths degree? Well, they might become a mathematician or a statistician. Um, they might become a data scientist so that's working with very large data sets and analyzing them to try and uh, obtain information, obtain predictions from them. You might work as a data science for data scientist for Amazon, for Google, for Facebook. You might work for a smaller company. You might work as a cryptanalyst, so that's working in cryptography, because I said to you that number theory, the abstract mathematics, is very much related to the, the, the behavior of, of, of um, cryptography. You might work in financial areas. So if you look at look at the mixture of words here, so financial planner. Uh, foreign exchange trade, trader, investment analyst, actuary, um, all of these kinds of words, I mean, I'm looking for other ones, budget analyst, all of them are really using mathematics in the sense of, you know, financial business kind of behavior. You can see many applications of, of maths for science, so mathematical biophysics, you know, working for something uh, working for a company that's trying to understand the biological behavior. So when I describe things like, you know, using networks to understand the behavior of the human brain, people might work for something like Public Health England, where they're using mathematics to, you know, really forecast the behavior of, of, of epidemics like the flu epidemic. And so not just the, 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 you know, the current COVID pandemic, but actually every year we have a flu, a flu um, epidemic Every year you need to worry about, you know, different kinds of diseases um, going through society. Um, many other things that people do, um, so quantity surveyor, um, jet fighter pilot, national security analyst, and of course people will actually often take the mathematics skills and use those for, um, you know, really problem solving, analyzing things. So people might go and become something like an analyst, they might become a management consultant, where they're not maybe specifically using their mathematical skills, but they're using their problem solving, their analytic skills. So mathematics degrees are a really great way 
to sort of springboard you into a very wide range of careers according to your interests. So I will stop there and I will stop sharing my screen and um, I would welcome questions either about the degrees that we have in Southampton or what it's like to study for degrees or if you'd like to ask questions about any of the maths that we've discussed, um, so geometry, topology, applications of this to, um, to studying data sets, um, any of these questions would be welcome. So thank you. So we've got one question here, which is, does topology apply to the fourth dimension or higher? So um, mathematicians have um, a wonderful way of working in many different dimensions, and you can indeed apply topology to um, things which are in two dimensions, in three dimensions, four dimensions and higher. So you can apply it abstractly in, in, in all dimensions. It becomes increasingly tiring on your brain to imagine things in, in higher dimensions, but the mathematics actually is cleverer than we are and tells us exactly what's going on. So another question we're often asked is um, when people come and talk to us about mathematics degrees is what does it look like to, you know, what does a typical week look like if you come and study a mathematics degree? You know, what do you do with your time? So typically what, what, you, what we would do is you, your, your week would be spread out between lectures where you are learning new materials. So that's a little bit like we've been doing today where the lecturer will be talking to you about you know new new concepts so i showed you pictures of topology but in a lecture you'd be kind of you know really defining it and and and, and understanding the definitions and understanding how to use them so you'd spend um some of your time in in lectures and then you'd spend some of your time really working on um using the material that you learned in lectures so that's kind of similar to what you do in school. So you learn, say, calculus, you learn how to differentiate something, and then you practice it in particular examples. And so in a, in a maths degree, you probably spend about, you know, three quarters of your time in classes, you know, being taught the material, and about a quarter of your time sort of practicing it. And then there's a lot of time that you would spend sort of, you know, studying yourself, probably about overall, overall about half of your time studying by yourself, so that you kind of, you know, you you really get to grips with the material, you practice the examples and then you worked on assignments. Um, types of assignments that you typically have are uh, things like um, you might have uh, problem sets, as we call them, that you hand in. And that's, I think, quite familiar to what you have from school. So again, it's when you've been practicing the concepts you've been taught and then you have practiced them on different kind of cases. And then you're sort of you know handing it in whether it's electronically or otherwise um, you might be doing um, tests um, in your class and then most of our kind of um, courses would actually have final exams in them as well we have with us um, a, a nick uh, nick wright who's um, our admissions tutor so i'm going to ask him we've had a question from somebody about advice for somebody writing a maths personal statement. I will give a little bit of commentary on it and perhaps Nick can also write an answer to the person who asked it. Um, I think the first thing I would say is actually to just be really authentic and to talk about why you enjoy maths and why you'd like to study maths. That's I think the most, the most that we'd like to see. Um, it's Typically for a maths degree, it's not going to be, a, a personal statement is not going to be something that makes a difference. Um, it's not something that's a strong factor in whether we give you an offer. Um, when we're looking at giving offers, we're really looking primarily at your academic profile. But then if it happens that, you know, in um, after you've had your offer and you get your grades, perhaps you don't quite get the grades um, that you hope to get, we might be taking into account personal statements and it's always good to see that the kind of authenticity, the sort of, you know, the interest that people have in maths 
why they want to study maths. We're not looking for people to have, you know, already pre-studied lots of university level maths. We're not looking for people to have, you know, necessarily have done things like, you know, Olympiads. What we're really looking for is, is, is why you find it interesting and why you want to um, study it. So Nick's going to give, um, he's going to give his reply to this and publish it from the perspective of a, a admissions tutor, um, just, just so you know the answer to that one. Um, is geometry studied with statistics and mechanics? That's an interesting question. Um, so there are very deep relations between all branches of mathematics. Um, and so um, certainly Euclidean geometry, which we discussed at the beginning of the talk, is very closely related to some questions in, in mechanics. So you know that if you think of, of questions like um, ladders leaning against walls and um, things, you know, wheels that are turning and things like that, you know that you often use quite a lot of geometry in solving mechanics problems. But when we start studying geometry at university, we would usually kind of be separate, separating out learning the geometry from learning about applications. So we would usually have a separate module which would, would be maybe about geometry and topology. And then we might have a separate application, a separate module which would be about applications, whether that was to applied mathematics, mechanics and physics type problems. And we'd have separate modules which would be, um, you know, about statistics. Um, so there would be, you know, many different, different flavors of statistics depending on the types of questions that you're going to ask. So you'd start with foundational statistics in your first year, you'd start with foundational calculus in your first year, and then as you go on through your degree, you increasingly specialise and, and, and go deeper into these subjects and you know, you'd get the opportunity to explore these things in, in, in more depth. How long does it take to complete a maths degree? Um, so we have two two different kinds of maths degrees. Um, one gives you a bachelor's and that's a three year degree program. Um, and so, you know, you study and you end up with a bachelor's in science. The other possibility is a four year degree in which you end with a master's in mathematics, um, a master's in science degree. Um, so a master's in science uh, takes four years because you spend the fourth year really digging deeper into the subject. You do a research type project. So you really um, you, you pick up more research, more you know, in-depth study skills. Um, for people who are specialising, uh, interested in careers where they might use quite high levels of mathematics. So some of the careers that I mentioned at the end, a master's level degree might be the natural entry point. And so people might want to do a four year degree. Um, other kinds of, you know, uh, careers that people are interested in, people might want to enter with a three year degree. Um, there's some flexibility. So a lot of our students are enrolled on a, a bachelor's, a three years degree, and then decide at some stage that they actually might quite like to do a master's and they can actually transfer across and, become, and do a four year degree. Conversely, some people might say, well, actually, you know, they're going to graduate in three years instead of four. They're going to transfer from master's back to bachelor's because, you know, they've realised that actually that would be the most appropriate path for them, that after the bachelor's degree, they have a particular plan in mind. So it's three years for a bachelor's, four years for a master's. There's a wonderful question ahead um, here. So does the existence of higher dimensions in mathematics provide solid evidence of these dimensions in the physical world, or is this simply an abstract mathematical entry? Um, so certainly evidence for the existence of higher dimensions doesn't come from mathematical existence alone. Um, so we would have to do an experiment that then we kind of go out of the realms of mathematics, we go into the realms of physical sciences, we would need to do an experiment to see evidence for additional dimensions. And actually, many of the current day um, experiments do actually um, things like um, CERN, the, the Particle Collider in Geneva, or some of the, um, the uh, astro astrophysics astronomy experiments are looking for the possibility of extra dimensions, additional dimensions. So we would need to actually, you know, we'd actually need to discover those to see that they were, live in the, in the real world. But actually, the, the question is really interesting in that um, many physical theories 
do really rely very strongly on abstract mathematical consistency to do the first checks of viability long before the experiments are built. So experiments are really expensive, right? So before you go and, and build an expensive experiment to go and look for something, it's really important to do every check that you can. And so mathematical consistency is one of the biggest checks that's done in modern day physics theories um, before you go and actually study them. The fourth dimension is time in our universe. Are there examples of other dimensions after the fourth dimension? So that's um, a linked question and it's, it's a very interesting and exciting one. Um, there are many theories of physics that suggest there are additional dimensions, additional small dimensions, and there are lots of experiments that are looking for them. Um, most of the physical theories, the mathematical consistency of them, suggests that the additional dimensions are actually really quite small and quite tricky to find in experiments. Um, but it's definitely, it's definitely a, a possibility that they're there. Um, really sophisticated question coming here. I've heard the Lagrangian being described as only a mathematical convenience and not having a physical meaning. Um, that's a really, really clever and sophisticated question. And, it, it, and it's quite an uh, interesting philosophical question. So when you are learning um, mechanics in school, you learn, um, you learn to write down the description in terms of equations, equations of motion. You learn Newton's equations. Um, so that's the starting point. Instead of starting with those equations, you can describe them in terms of something called the Lagrangian. So you can wrap them all up in a description, an elegant mathematical description that's called the Lagrangian. And it's equivalent to the equations. Um, I would say it's a mathematical elegance and convenience. I wouldn't say it doesn't have any physical meaning. I would say that you can either start with the equations, the equations of motion, so F equals MA, or you can write the same thing as the Lagrangian and they are equivalent to each other. In both cases, those are our starting point. That's our assumption that that's the laws of the universe. That's the laws which are describing our physical behavior. Um, so each is equivalent, but we don't teach people um, Lagrangians in, in school. It's a more sophisticated mathematics. And so some people sometimes think that the equations of motion, Newton's equations, are more fundamental than Lagrangian. They're kind of equivalent to each other. They're both different descriptions of the physics, but the Lagrangian is a bit more elegant. What is the most interesting topic in mathematics? Um, gosh, I would be spoiled for choice there and I would probably upset my colleague um, if I if I didn't choose a topic that he likes too. Um, well, th there are just all of these branches of math mathematics, whether we're talking group theory, number theory, geometry and topology, uh, things I haven't mentioned here, um, you know, analysis and so on. Um, they are all absolutely fascinating. I personally work on applications of mathematics to, to physics, to, um, to quantum computing, so using um, the quantum world to make computing faster. Um, but as I do that, I use all kinds of different branches of mathematics, number theory, geometry and analysis, and they are all amazingly um, exciting. Are there any books to recommend? Um, that's another really tricky book, tricky thing. Um, I personally have always loved Ian Stewart's books on, on mathematics. Um, I also love the lectures of Marcos de Sotoy from Oxford. If, you, if you've ever attended those, they are you know, really energetic and wonderful. I think there's a fantastic range of books on modern mathematics that you can find you know, in any kind of bookstore these days. And actually just delving into them is, is just great. Different books have a different style. You see the sense of the author coming out. Um, I study, started to study you know, mathematics and physics from reading Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time. That was the thing that really hooked me. Um, other people said you know, they picked up A Brief History of Time and they didn't really understand what he was doing and they didn't find it very interesting. But they loved other books. You know, they, they, they loved um, you know, different kinds of books. Um, so it's it's really a very personal it's very personal choice, but I would just recommend browsing because these days there's just so many fantastic books on explaining kind of um, sophisticated, complicated mathematics in fantastic ways. 
What's the difference between mathematical physics and theoretical physics? That's a wonderful question too. Um, yeah, I think mathematical physics I would I would use to refer to things where you're using a lot of mathematics um, and, and you're using quite sophisticated high level mathematics and maybe developing or extending mathematics as you go. And I probably reserve theoretical physics to be more using existing mathematics, but the line between these is incredibly blurred. Um, and some people actually refer to something called physical mathematics, which is where you take your physical intuition, your physical, um, your sense of physics, and you use that to develop new mathematics. So about 30 years ago, um, the Fields Medal for Mathematics, which is almost the Nobel Prize type level um, prize for mathematics, was won by a physicist who'd used physical intuition to understand the mathematics of knots. This is Edward Witten from Princeton. And that I think is almost an example of physical mathematics. He'd used his intuition as a physicist to create new mathematics. Is it possible to take a single maths degree but involve many physics modules? Absolutely, yes. Um, so the, I think I've sort of kind of covered here that what mathematics departments do is incredibly broad. And I, I think that's why UK maths departments are so wonderful. They include so many different things. So a lot of what's taught in a maths degree, actually there, 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 are, there are things which are there which are inherently physics modules, but people can also go and borrow, um, they, they can go and take things specifically from the physics department. If you want to take a lot of physics modules, it's probably appropriate to take something like a maths with physics degree. So we have an M math phys degree, which is maths and physics. If you think you want to take, you know, just the odd physics module, the occasional physics module that can often be done through a maths degree and inherently within the maths degree, you'll actually find um, some physics modules. So I've mentioned things like we do relativity, gravitational waves because they're so mathematical, because they use so much mathematics. They're taught by the mathematics department anyway. Physicists often come over and take them with our math students, but they are taught by the mathematics department and are accessible to our math, uh, math students. Lots of really sophisticated and wonderful questions. Um, I'm really impressed that anyone has um, anyone has heard of Lagrangians and and has actually sort of heard about you know, the philosophical debate almost about whether the Lagrangian is a more fundamental description than just writing down the description of the system as equations, which is say what Newton would have done. Um, so Lagrange comes a little bit after Newton. It's a really, really, really interesting question. Um, you can pick this up in, 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 in some of the popular mathematics books, and it's, I think, a really really interesting thing to think about the, the foundations of concepts and the philosophy behind some mathematics concepts. Um, do we offer a maths degree with qualified teacher status? Um, again, I have Nick Wright here, our admissions tutor in the background, and, and he might like to pick that one up just to give you a, a clear answer. Um, we definitely, you know, our maths degrees you can do a um, teaching practice, but I think to get qualified teaching status, you would actually always have to do that extra year where you actually really did the placements in the school and you got the training. We have a very strong education department in the University of Southampton and actually a steady stream of our math students do go across the education um, department after their math degree, usually to do a PGC, so a postgraduate certificate of education in mathematics, in, in secondary school mathematics. That's the main route that they take. Um, some of our students go, go in um, to, to maths teaching um, via schemes such as Teach First, so that's where they're completely embedded in the school. But to my understanding, that's something they do after they've um, done their degree, although they may do tasters um, during the degree they may do a taster both in terms of one of the modules they can take with us, which is called communicating and teaching maths, where you can do teaching practice in school. And we also are often offered the opportunity, you know, everyone would love to recruit maths teachers, right? So we are often offered the opportunity for our students at the end of their first or second year to go and do placements in schools, in secondary schools, particularly um, to, you know, have a taster of, 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 of teaching 
with the idea that they might qualify as a teacher afterwards. Um, hopefully that answers the question, but um, hopefully Nick also can, can, can come in on that one. So we don't seem to have any more questions here. Um, thank you very much for all the questions. Some of them are absolutely um, really wonderful um, uh, and insightful and deep kinds of questions. Are there any final questions that people would like to, to ask? I can see that Nick is replying to the question about offering a maths degree with qualified teacher status. So I'll let him I'll let him answer that one just to make sure that we've got it um, absolutely right. So I mean, as, while we're touching on placements, um, people are often interested in the idea of doing placements to try out particular careers, and we are often offered quite a lot of opportunities for our students to do summer placements, um, all kinds of different possibilities, you know, across all our degrees. But there's also the possibility of doing a year long placement, so a year in employment, as we call it, um, where people typically would do that between their second and their third year of study. And that's something where the university supports you to find the placement. Um, so there's a whole kind of team that works with you. And people would, would, would usually go on placements that are directly related to their degree. So some, somebody who's specialising in statistics, for example, might go and work in a statistics research group in a pharmaceutical company so they can see how statistics is used in industry. Somebody who's interested in specialising in actuarial science might go and work in an insurance company as an actuarial analyst to sort of explore whether that's something that they're really going to want to do as a career. So people who do the year in employment, it's an opportunity to taste a career, but it's also an opportunity to actually kind of, you know, work with an employer. Many of the people who do these employment years will get a job offer from the employer and then come back to the university for their final year to actually, you know, having a job offer, which is, is great because it kind of takes the pressure off. They don't have to be looking for jobs. And when they come back into their final year, having worked outside, um, outside education for a year, they typically come in with with different kinds of skills, you know, full of energy, really great, great um, writing and communication skills. So they do really, really well in their final year. Um, so we absolutely encourage people to do those placement years. Is there any use of topology in complex analysis? Um, um, I'm going to leave that one for Nick. Um, complex analysis is 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 really done in two dimensional um, two dimensional surfaces, and one does have a very you know interesting complex structure of how the two dimensional surfaces kind of wind around each other. The, the structure of these, um, so in this sense, one can have um, certainly one can do complex analysis on surfaces of different topology. Um, and actually, that's quite foundational in 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 one part of sort of mathematical physics that I work on, which is is called string theory. So that's the sort of fundamental theory, proposed fundamental theory of nature, which is really based on different two dimensional surfaces of different topologies. So we show things with one hole and two holes and so on. That's what it's based on. Um, when we teach complex analysis, um, I have to say we we really focus in the first discussions of this on, on just doing complex analysis just on a plane, right? So we're really just doing it in the complex plane. And so those kinds of considerations wouldn't come in. But I'm sure Nick is going to give you, um, as a pure mathematician, he's going to give you um, a much more um, nuanced and articulate answer to me than, than I do to that one. Um, I see that Nick has um, answered the question about maths degree with qualified teacher status. So indeed, PTCE, teach first, those are great. And then actually having some practice with us beforehand. As Nick said, we have temporarily had to suspend the module where students get to do teaching experience, but we have been offered over this summer placements for students. So we've got, um, I think, at least one student who's actually been in a secondary school for the last couple of weeks 
um, where the secondary school wanted to invite people in to have a taste of teaching because they really want to encourage them to be, be teachers. And we intend to reinstate that full module where people get to do uh, basically teach all through um, from January right through to May in a school. We want to reinstate that as soon as we can, as soon as secondary schools can let more people um, come back in. Is joint honours, now that's a really interesting question, so let me read it out. Is a joint honours course such as maths and physics more intensive than a single honours course, which is just maths? I think the answer is, is no. You do the same amount of study, the same number of hours of study, whether you do joint honours or single honours. So that's the basic answer. You do the same amount of study. Of course, if you do joint honours, whether that's maths and physics or whether that's maths with computer science, where you're mixing different disciplines, you are building up skills in slightly different disciplines. So you're not studying more. It's not necessarily more study, but you are actually kind of picking up a breadth of skills. At the same time, in a single honours degree, so if you do a maths degree and you spend some of your time doing pure mathematics and some of your time doing statistics, you'd also be mixing slightly different disciplines, slightly different things. So I wouldn't say it's more intensive. I wouldn't say it's harder. Sometimes people worry it's harder. It's definitely not the case that, that students do worse on joint honours. They do just as well. They get you know just as many good degrees, two ones and firsts. So I think it's really about what people want to do. Um, that's the important thing. Um, what would you recommend doing to prepare for university? Um, so if you're going to do a university maths degree, if you have um, if you have uh, have the chance over over the summer before you start the university uh, university, it can be good to kind of um, really just practice your calculus, particularly to make sure it's kind of you know it's 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 fluent. Um, so that's something we will work on a lot during the first part of the first year, but that's a good thing to do. If you have have not done further maths. You shouldn't worry because quite a lot of students won't have done further maths and come and do maths degrees. Um, but if you if you want to pick out just one topic from further maths that will be really useful to look at before you come, we would probably say it's complex numbers. So it will teach complex numbers from scratch because not everyone will have seen them. We will have British students and we have international students. They will have done slightly different curricula. So we definitely teach it to you from scratch. But if you've seen it before, that's a really good preparation um, ahead of a, of a university maths degree. Um, next question is, have I done a PhD in mathematics? Absolutely. Um, to become a lecturer, professor in mathematics, you will have a doctorate in mathematics and you will have mathematics research. Um, our staff you know, really mix their teaching with their research. And that I think came through in the slides I was giving that you know, what we're teaching you is very much linked to what we research, the, the, the research that we did from our PhDs and onwards. So my particular specialism, as I said, is in, in theoretical physics, mathematical physics, particularly questions about the fundamental theories of nature, about quantum computing. Nick Wright, who's answering our questions in the chat, is um, a um, pure mathematician who specializes in particular in geometric groups, geometric group theory. And that's where he would have done his PhD and that's where you know, he works. And we have, as well as the students who are studying with us for taught degrees, bachelor's and master's degrees, we have about 100 students who are studying with us for doctorate degrees, PhDs. So you know, after finishing their, their first degree, they're doing a research degree with us, either with a view to becoming um, a researcher in mathematics in a university, or perhaps with a view of being a researcher in, in industry, in business. Um, how much maths is involved in a physics degree in comparison to a maths degree? Um, well, there's certainly a lot of maths in a physics degree. Um, you know, in some sense, physics is applied mathematics. Um, if we kind of try to quantify it, I, I would say, you know, probably in a, in a physics degree, you spend about maybe a third of your time in your first year sort of studying maths and maybe about 20, 20, 25 percent of your time in your second year. And then whether you carry on with maths, it depends whether you want to specialize in the theory side of it, where you, you would keep doing maths. But if you want to be an experimental physicist, you might not do so much more maths. So, 
you know, it's kind of 30% first year in physics degree, 25% in second year, and then it depends what you're interested in. Compared to a maths degree where you spend, you know, really all of your time doing maths, mathematical sciences, more broadly statistics and so on. Where can a maths degree lead you? Um, I want to sort of say, you know, pretty much anywhere you want to go. It's a very good um, foundational, you know, foundation for many different kinds of careers. So increasingly, I would say employers are looking for people to have very good quantitative analytic skills. They want people to be able to understand data, manipulate data. And so, you know, right across the spectrum, um, a mass, you know, maths graduates are considered to be very, very attractive. So, you know, both in financial areas, so you might become, you might work in the city, um, the city of London in a sort of, you know, uh, working in a big bank, you might work in, um, you know, as a, as a management consultant, giving strategic advice, you might become, you know, an accountant. You might um, become, we've already discussed, becoming a maths teacher. You might work in, in um, a company as a software engineer, as a data scientist. You might work um, in a kind of a specific context using your mathematics. So all the things we've discussed using statistics to analyze things for pharmaceutical companies, um, hospitals, um, public health. There's just there's just so many different options that that you, you can you can take. Um, I think there are very you know the generic graduate careers such as you know applying to become a management consultant, um, a applying to be an accountant, and so on. All of these kind of things which which don't need some specific degree, they would absolutely welcome a maths degree. But there are also many careers and increasingly many careers where having a quantitative degree is crucial. So if you just Google data scientist, um, there are so many jobs where people want you to be able to analyze and interpret data and maths degrees are just a great foundation uh, for that. Uh, final question, what was it like to work with Stephen Hawking um, as he was my doctoral, you know, you're correct. I'm, I'm impressed that somebody looked this up. What was it like to work with Stephen Hawking? Um, I would say very inspiring, so Stephen is was of course a very very distinguished scientist um, working in the areas of black holes and cosmology and Einstein's theory of gravity and you know very deeply insightful um, very profound ideas and so it was yeah fantastic to have the opportunity to work with him and of course inspiring because you know given his health it, you know it was just remarkable everything that he could do. What sets the maths degree at Southampton apart from other universities? Um, I would I would pick out two particular features or maybe three features. I'll go through them. The first, I think, is the breadth of uh, topics on offer at Southampton. So really going all the way from abstract pure mathematics through statistics to financial type mathematics to management science, so quantitative methods for management, operational research, to applications of mathematics through to science and engineering. We have a particularly broad program which allows you to, you know, either specialize in a particular area or take a kind of a range of topics. Um, so I think it's the breadth of the degree I would pick out. The second thing I would pick out is the flexibility that our degree programs are designed so that you can transfer across between them if you actually change your mind. Um, so a lot of students will kind of come into university thinking they would like to specialise in one area and then realising actually they might like to specialise in another. We've already mentioned bachelor's and master's degrees. So the fact that it, we've designed them to be flexible, so all our math students take the same sort of core courses in the first year and that gives them the same foundations and then you can move between them. So that's the second point. So it's the breadth, the flexibility. And the third point I would actually sort of say that sets Southampton apart is we have a dedicated student centre for mathematics. So um, some of the some of the um, study that I talked about where you're doing kind of um, problem solving um, and you're working with with staff and, you know, trying to sort of apply the maths that you learn is held in our dedicated student centre. And it's a kind of it's quite unusual to have a dedicated centre for sort of math students. And it's a place where people can study together, they can learn from each other. 
it can also be used very much in a social sense. Um, so it's a place where you can actually meet different students from different year groups. You can meet students from your own year group. Um, we use the Math Student Centre for um, employment events. So when employers come, we will actually rent one in that student centre. So I think it's those those three three particular things um, that I would I would really pick out. Um, OK, I've always wanted to get a theoretical physicist's opinion on this. Why is Richard Feynman given the almost rock star status in the world of physics compared to the other physicists of his time? Um, so Feynman, I should say, I mean, Feynman died in, in the mid 1980s, um, so I never met him personally. Um, many of my colleagues knew Feynman very, very well, and he was extremely charismatic and original and very good at explaining. He had remarkable skills at explaining physics. So Feynman, I mean, I think he famously gave a sequence of lectures in the 1960s, which have been written up as textbooks. But that's just one example of just how, you know, how original Feynman's understanding um, uh, was and, and how good he was at articulating physics. That, I think, is where, why he has rock star status. Um, you know, people have mixed uh, mixed personalities. So I think from a modern perspective, we might look back at Feynman and say, well, maybe at times he was a little bit, um, you know, he might have been a little bit arrogant, a little bit sexist and things like that. Nobody's perfect. But the defining sort of strength of why people are so, um, you know, feel so strongly about Feynman, it's really that he has such a deep and an intuitive understanding of physics. He was one of the first, for example, to really realize that quantum computing was going to be a huge thing. Do other departments in Southampton or UK have a dedicated student center? It's actually quite unusual to have a dedicated space. I'm not aware of other UK maths departments having such a dedicated center as we do. So it, it's quite special. Um, it's a, I think it's a great thing for creating a sense of community between our students um, and our staff. You know, really, our students care very deeply about each other. So our older students really want to take care of our younger students. And I think that very much is linked to the fact that we have a dedicated student centre where students interact with each other. Is a maths degree a very difficult degree? Um, I would not say I think a maths degree is a, is a, a degree that can stretch you at times. Um, you know, some of the things we talked about today, you can see that they're, they're really conceptually challenging, right? You know, the idea of thinking in higher dimensions, visualizing geometry in four and five dimensions. So they are challenging, but you're guided through. So there's a lot of kind of help to get you through. Um, in that sense, I wouldn't use the phrasing that a maths degree is a very difficult degree. Because I think, you know, um, people are very, you know, staff are very good at getting students to kind of go from one step to the other. Students who've got a, a good A level in maths, and, you know, an A grade in maths, you know, they all have the potential to do very well at a maths degree. And what they get from that is a huge amount. So they get a huge amount of analytic skills, problem solving skills, the ability to think abstractly. So the sense that you can think in four and five and six dimensions that's kind of transferable to really thinking about really challenging and, 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 and difficult problems in a kind of abstract way. Um, so it's really rewarding. So we seem to have, I think, no more questions coming. I'm now reading Nick's answer about complex analysis. Um, so complex analysis, absolutely, it's simple topology. That's a good, that, you see that I, I said that Nick was going to write a much better answer than I was on that question. Um, yeah, so complex analysis in the plane has some simple topology. If you start doing complex analysis on the surfaces I showed you earlier, like things like donuts and things with two holes, that's when it really gets quite fun. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really beautiful and elegant area of mass, which is quite used, used quite heavily in my area of physics. So if we have um, no more questions, uh, I would like to thank everyone for all their wonderful questions. Um, really, really good questions. Um, and I think maybe we can conclude for today. So thank you very much. 
If you do have any more questions, please feel free to contact us. Um, Nick Wright, who's been answering your questions in the chat, will be more than happy to pick up any questions you have related to the course, the courses at Southampton, admissions questions, anything like that. Um, he would be happy to pick those up. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you for coming.